Uh, and you think, you may think, well, what does immigration have to do with American Indians? Well, it has everything to do with American Indians, despite the fact you were here and you've been here for maybe ever. Um, when the Europeans first came over here, uh, they were the immigrants. And, of course, they remained the immigrants. And then, of course, they, the, the United States was established um, and the Indian Wars were taking place. Um, the Indian Wars back east ended uh, before the Civil War. Well, almost, yeah, they all ended before the Civil War. They all ended in the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, those Indians were moved out of the east and they were moved west. Uh, most of them were moved to uh, Oklahoma. That's why my wife just got stuck in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And Shawnee tribe is from uh, Indiana and uh, Kentucky and, and Ohio. Uh, so why in the world would they move all the, those Indians back uh, west? Well, the reason they moved them out west is so that they could steal their land. And of course, that's my our farm in Indiana is on is on an Indian old Indian village. Strangely enough, so we used to dig stuff up all the time, lots of arrowheads and all that. Um, and so what does that have to do with it? Okay, so immigration policy. So you got to remember that every all the uh, Indians left the uh, East Coast, uh, except the ones in, in Upper New York State. They stayed, the Mohawk, uh, the Iroquois Nation, where they were able to write a treaty uh, with the United States government, which allowed them to stay. So if you look at all the, the reservations in the United States, almost all of them are west of the Mississippi River. There are some... Uh, there are some back east, um, the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe, those are all, that's actually the same tribe uh, with different dialects. Uh, in Minnesota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Okay? Uh, so they, they got, well, he's what? How about the Seminoles? Seminole, Seminole, yeah, Seminole were kind of interesting people because uh, the ones they could catch, they shipped out west. And, and there's a huge group of, of Seminole in, uh, in, in uh, Oklahoma. As a matter of fact, I have a good friend uh, who's Seminole from, from Oklahoma. Uh, but the ones that could hide in the, in the Everglades, they couldn't catch. The same way with the Cherokee. The Cherokee were able, some of the Cherokee were able to hide up in the mountains in uh, North Carolina and uh, northern Georgia. Uh, and so they didn't leave. Uh, the uh, chicken, the Choctaw that they couldn't catch, uh, they stayed in, in, in Mississippi. And to, to this day, uh, the uh, Choctaw tribe of Mississippi is one of the richest tribes in the United States, mainly because they have diversified. They started building casinos, uh, they have uh, lumber rights, they have, they're the second largest employer in Mississippi after the state of Mississippi, as strange as that may seem. Anyway, okay, so some, some tribes were able to stay, but most of them were moved out. Uh, and they, they all had their own long, long march uh, that went all the way from wherever they started to uh, usually Oklahoma. Uh, the Shawnee tribe was kind of interesting. The Kickapoo tribe is also kind of interesting. The Kick, Kickapoo tribe started out up around Chicago. <laughs> And they moved them out to uh, they moved them out to Nebraska. Then they moved them down to Kansas. Then they moved them to the Texas uh, Mexico border. And half of them were pissed off with the Americans, so they decided that they'd go into Mexico. But uh, yeah, uh, the ones that could escape, or the ones that assimilated enough that uh, they were. Uh, they were accepted and didn't have to go. They just stayed back east. But for the most part, almost all the Indians left uh, the East Coast. Uh, so that brings us up to the, after the Civil War, 1865, the Civil War ended. Uh, immigration started exploding in the United States. Uh, so uh, up through 1880, uh, we had lots of immigration. All of a sudden in 1880, all kinds of crap was going on in Europe. So a lot of peasants were leaving. Uh, one of the problems before were if you were a, a Russian peasant, uh, you belonged to you belonged to the, uh, the the aristocrat that owned the land, and you couldn't leave. They wouldn't let, let you leave. Uh, this was going on all over all over Eastern Europe. It was going on in Poland. Uh, so then, in 1880, of course, uh, things got more liberal in in Europe, and they started allowing people to leave. So one of the things that happened 
was the that uh, we, we had this huge influx of, of immigration coming into the United States. And that started in 1880. 60% uh, of all the people that immigrated to the United States immigrated between uh, 1880 and 1920. And then finally in 1920, somebody decided to, to, to uh, uh, close off the, the tap and they, and they, they ended immigration in, into the United States. But between 1880 and 1920, we had all this mass of immigration coming into the United States. Okay, so we've got, we've got uh, two problems now. We've got immigrants coming into the United States who don't speak English, and we have American Indians who don't speak English as well. Uh, we also have most of the politicians were living back east. If you think of, uh, of what was going on at the time, uh, Arizona wasn't a state, New Mexico wasn't a state, Oklahoma wasn't a state. Uh, so, you know, what, and, and how, just how populous were the states that we had uh, that were west of the Mississippi River? And the answer is not very populous at all, uh, if you think about it. Uh, why in the world did they ever make Nevada a state? Why did they make Nevada a state? I'm sorry? They needed the money. I know, they needed the money. Why did they make Colorado State? They didn't have enough people. Why did they make Colorado a state? They needed the money. Uh, so where did they, what money were, am I talking about? I'm talking about gold and silver uh, uh, deposits in those states. That's why they made Montana a state. I mean, Montana to this day only has a million people in it. Uh, Wyoming has like 750,000 people in it. So why in the world would you ever make Wyoming and Montana and Colorado and Nevada and uh, Utah, why would you make them states? Because they had, they had gold. So do all these states have claims more, if you look at it in a bigger picture, in a bigger, wider picture, that bigger lands of claims? The, yeah, the other thing that the, the, the uh, federal government did was take all the land. Uh, so if the land wasn't occupied by somebody, a reservation or um, an individual that, that owned that, that portion of the land, they made it into BLM land, Bureau of Land Management. Um, so all that land, and, and some of these states, even to this day, the majority of the land in that state is BLM land. Okay, so we've got we got a whole bunch of problems in the United States. We got all these people coming in. We've got to we got to, uh, to convert them into being good Americans. Uh, a lot of them didn't read, uh, but but the reality is we didn't really care about the 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 the, old, the adults coming in. It was their kids that we worried about. Uh, so we we decided that we needed to educate these people. How in the world were we going to get them to assimilate to become good Americans? Well, what the first thing we needed to do was convince them that they weren't good Germans, good uh, Italians. They, we needed to get, to get that idea out of them, which wasn't very difficult because Germany didn't become a country until 1870. Um, uh, it, Italy didn't become a country until 1860. So the, this nationalism, this concept of nationalism, d didn't exist in those two countries. It existed for, for the English, it existed for the, uh, the, the French, but it didn't exist for the Irish, because the Irish didn't have their own country either. It was, they were being controlled by the Brits. So we had all these people that didn't have this concept of nationalism. They were coming into the United States, and we had to force them to assimilate one way or the other. And we did that through education. When did the boarding school system in the United States start? Have you learned that in any of your classes? When did the boarding school start? No, 1840. There we go. Edison, he said it was 1840. 1875. The first, the first boarding school was in 1875, and it really didn't kick off until the 1880s. Wait a minute, wait a minute, we've got two things going on at the same time. We've got, we're trying to assimilate uh, the, uh, the Indian tribes, especially the ones we kicked west of the Mississippi River, and we're, we're also trying to assimilate all of these immigrants. So they used the same policy. Remember, most of the people in the United States are on the East Coast. Most of the politicians are from New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, 
uh, Michigan, uh, Indiana. Uh, they're, they're from places where they don't really have Indians anymore. So they wanted, they, they needed to assimilate uh, two groups of individuals. One group was the immigrants coming in uh, from, from Europe, and the others were uh, American Indians. And that's the reason those two policies were almost identical. They decided that they were going to do it in the same way. Instead of uh, uh, supporting multiculturalism, they, de they decided that they would create uh, the melting, this infamous melting pot that they talk so much about. Did it actually work? Uh, well, yeah, people did change. And those people that came to the United States from Italy and from Germany and from Ireland, yeah, they, you know, they didn't have nationalism of their own, so they had, they had the Irish and the Italian and the German culture, but they actually didn't have a country of their own that they felt uh, um, any, any uh, affection for, because there was no country. So we had all these Irish and Germans and Italians coming into the United States. And so we were able to assimilate all of these select individuals. Another group that was relatively large that came into the United States was the Jewish population. And of course they had no country whatsoever. They couldn't, they couldn't attach themselves to any country. Because uh, even, even uh, if they had lived there for two or three hundred years, one of the things that happened to these select individuals was that because of their religion, they were, re they were rejected individuals. So they came to the United States, and they were easily, relatively easily assimilated. So they wanted to do the same thing with the American Indians. They decided that that was the best course to take. Uh, throughout the, uh, the 19th century, if you look at, if you read the congressional records, uh, when they're dealing with American Indians, one of the, the things that they always said was, if we don't deal with this, then all the Indians will be exterminated. They, they said that, uh, and they said it over and over and over again. Uh, practically every uh, Congress was, uh, and, and when they were trying to deal with the American, pro the, uh, the American Indian problem, uh, they said if we don't do something about this, they're going to be exterminated. And part of the problem, of course, was the diseases that people were contracting. Uh, but the other problem was how in the world are we going to, to uh, get these individuals to assimilate to our, uh, to our to the American culture, which didn't actually exist if you think about it, because uh, the American culture didn't become an intact culture until probably the middle of the 19th century uh, into the 20th century. And we didn't start singing all these crazy patriotic songs until in, into the 20th century. Okay. So that, that's what was going on. So when we talk about, uh, about immigrants uh, and, and how they assimilate, we're really talking about what uh, the, the American educational system did uh, to the people that came into the United States. We were trying to assimilate them. We weren't trying to acculturate them. We were trying to assimilate them. And so one of the reasons they did what they did to the American Indians was because these were people back east, they had no clue about American Indians, uh, they didn't see any themselves, so they just used the same plan uh, to assimilate uh, the American Indians that they did, uh, the immigrants. And it actually, they talked about extermination way, way too much. Uh, they were afraid that American Indians were going to disappear. The other thing, there, there were people in the United States that didn't want, uh, didn't want your culture to disappear. Uh, there, were, there were groups around the United States uh, that, uh, and of course most of them were back east, so they were thinking of the noble red man. That's one of the things that they, uh, one of the statements that they made, the noble red man, we need to make sure that they don't uh, disappear. Uh, so it was really kind of an interesting uh, interaction taking place. So strangely enough, <clears throat> the, one of the groups that saved that kept the, the United States Army from trying to exterminate everybody was, uh, were religious groups. And they decided that they needed to Christianize the Indians. And that probably s allowed them to, uh, to do something with the American Indians that uh, wasn't happening up in Canada, wasn't happ happening with the uh, Aborigines over in Australia. Uh, they tried to exterminate all the, uh, the uh, Australian Aborigines. Uh, they had to hide. Um, you know, some of the, some of, if you've seen Quickly Down Under or any of the other movies about Australia, uh, about Australia in the uh, 19th century, uh, ugly, ugly stuff. A lot uglier than it was in the United 
1906. I mean, they were they were literally they were poisoning water to try to kill these people. You know, that kind of stuff didn't happen very often in the United States. As ugly as that is. Okay, so when we're talking, we are talking about immigrants. Uh, I, I think it's okay over here if you need to move over here. Not that I want you to get anywhere close to me. But you can come over. Mm -hmm. get let you. Too. <laughs> You're such a wimp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the chairs are, are dry. And it's not raining right now. Of course, that thing, if that ever, ever lets go, it ran on top of your head. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's the history of the situation. Uh, has anybody heard any other? Uh, have I missed anything? Uh, you don't have to believe what I say. I'm, I'm getting my information from stuff that I've read. I'm sure Marius has read other stuff. We have these, we st these conversations from time to time. Sometimes he glazes over like I'm, I'm telling a lie or something. I don't know. <laughs> Either that or I'm putting him to sleep, which is probably more likely. Okay, so uh, does anybody have anything else to say about this? The, the whole assimilation process? I know it's an ugly, ugly uh, history. Um, we try to... There's a lot going on in, in Canada that was not going on in the United States. Um, living in Montana, one of the things that we ran into, uh, we ran into tribes that were actually kicked out of Canada. They are actually removed from Canada by the, uh, by the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Policemen. Yeah, those, those strange guys. Yeah. Uh, and they, they tried to kill as many as they could. Uh, this was during the Real um, uh, uprising in uh, Western Canada, uh, and there were some tribes that thought, well, this is a better deal. If we can create our own country, our own Indian Matee country uh, in the north, uh, then uh, some of the tribes from the, the United States will go up there. And that's exactly what happened. The Assiniboine, some of the Sioux went north, uh, some of the Gromont went north, and um, when they put the uprising down, they just started shooting everybody. And they put uh, snipers on the uh, border. And as people were trying to flee across, back across into the United States, the, uh, the Royal, Canada, Royal Canadian Mounted Police were, were picking them off and shooting people, as ugly as that is. So once they got back down here, well, back down to the United States, what did they do? Well, they joined their, their members of the other members of their tribe that were still living in the United States is what they did. Uh, so, but they, they, of course, they weren't all exterminated. So if you go up to Canada, you've got the Assiniboine tribe and you've got the uh, Carry the Kettle tribe up in, up in Canada. It's the same group of people when they go back and forth from time to time. And the Grovelon have a, have a group up there. I think they're the Bloods. I think that's the tribe. Anyway, there you go. Different stuff, different ideas. Uh, the Chippewa Cree were kicked out of, of Canada by the by the Royal Canadian Canadian Mounted Policemen. So, and they have a, uh, a reservation at Rocky Boy Reservation. That's Rocky Boy was the chief of Stone Child. Okay. Rocky Boy Stone Child. Wait a minute, let me think about that. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about cultural distance. There are various measures that can be used to determine acculturation across cultures. One indirect measure is language performance. And of course, uh, one of the things they tried to do, was, and one of the reasons they, they wouldn't let anybody uh, speak their own language was because they were trying to uh, Americanize uh, the American Indians. This is what they did with the immigrants uh, coming into the East Coast. Uh, so this is what they did with, the, with uh, you guys. This is what they did at the boarding schools. Uh, and they tried to make you into good Americans by changing your clothes, by cutting your hair, and not letting you speak your own language. And that was, that was their, the technique that they used back east with the immigrants. I'm not trying to rationalize why they did what they did, uh, but they're not real bright. And, you know, you get one formula and you think that formula fits for everybody. And that's exactly what happened. They, they used it on everybody. <clears throat> but they used it on... Uh, uh, people back east as well. One indirect measure is language performance, of course. Uh, several studies show that the best predictors of acculturative uh, success is language ability. Uh, Gullhorn and uh, Gullhorn and Gullhorn in 1963 
discovered this, and Ying and Lisi in 1991 uh, replicated uh, that piece of information. Knowles, Pond, and Clement uh, speculated that the greater the confidence and the mastery of the, the host uh, country's language, the greater the identity with the culture. Uh, so if you can't speak the language, then it's really hard to feel like you're part of that culture. Uh, this is something that, uh, that I observed uh, living in Japan, especially in Japan and Germany. Uh, if you could speak German to any extent at all, one of the first things they did to you, with you, when you went to Germany was, was uh, give you a German language class. And of course, none of it took with me. Uh, or with my wife, strangely enough, but my kids picked up German fairly quickly. Same, same way with Japanese. They were actually just trying to teach us words that we could use. Where's the bathroom? You know, we're looking for the bathroom if you need to use the bathroom. Uh, the other thing they told us is, well, oh, wait a minute, this is, these are public facilities in, in Japan. You don't, you don't want to use those facilities. They're not, they're not very nice. You might be surprised. Uh, many researchers have found a connection between language skill and success uh, acculturating and of course the people that acculturate the best in the United States are usually the ones who speak English the best. Uh, but not, may, maybe not. Uh, they're, they're, uh, some people will, will live in their own communities and they'll do fine. They'll be okay. Uh, especially the people that speak Spanish. There's a Polish community in, in Chicago that is three generations large. There are some of those, of course, uh, all of these people have had to go to school uh, when, they were, when they were school age, uh, but they also speak Polish, and they, they, uh, they publish a Polish language newspaper, as interesting as that is. But even the, the, old, the people that just come over here from Poland, uh, they do very well in, uh, in those communities, in their own communities. Uh, another uh, language, uh, potentially, is Spanish. Uh, Spanish is probably the second official uh, American language. English is not the official language of the United States. There is no official language of the United States. So Spanish is probably the second uh, official language of the United States. It's probably spoken more than any other language. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, you may have seen the video uh, there was a lady uh, up in Montana. She was visiting from here. She's from Arizona. And she's a third generation Hispanic. Uh, she does speak with a, with a Spanish accent. Uh, but she was up in Montana, and they were speaking Spanish, and she was stopped by the border patrol, which seems kind of odd. Or does it? Why in the world would you stop somebody in Montana for speaking Spanish? And of course, this is Montana. It turns out that the Border Patrol has the right to stop you within 100 miles of the border. So if you're, if you're at the 90 mile mark, uh, and they can stop, all, they can stop everybody. They can stop me, they can stop anybody. Uh, but as it turned out, this lady was like 150 miles from the border. And here she, here she is in, in uh, right outside of Great Falls, Montana. No, she was up in uh, Cutbank. Uh, she was in Cutbank. And, uh, <laughs> She was at a convenience store, and the Border Patrol uh, was down there. For, they were down there for something, and he heard her speaking Spanish to her sister, who was also three generations okay, in, in, in the United States. And he stopped her. Is that legal? Should they have been sued? Federal government being sued? You know the federal government has, has to allow you to, to sue them. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea, but I don't, it's a Trump administration. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to allow themselves to be sued. But it was, it was really kind of an interesting situation. Uh, she was Hispanic, and they stopped her on the Canadian border, which, I don't know, what does that mean? So why would somebody, why would they stop somebody in, in Montana for speaking Spanish? How many Hispanics do they have up there anyway? They have more Hispanics than they have African Americans, but that's neither here nor there. If you're African American, what's the probability they're going to stop you for, the Border Patrol is going to stop you for being a, an illegal immigrant if you're African American? They're more likely to stop a white person, strangely enough. They may be Canadian. 
I don't want them guys in our country. I've got a whole lot. <laughs> but if you're black, how many, how many black people in the United States are actually immigrants? There are some, I guess. Barack Obama's dad was, a, was an immigrant in the United States. The reason they stopped her had to do with drugs. Not that she had any drugs, but the drugs in Montana usually come up from down here. Thanks, thanks you guys for letting it across your border. And then they, they transported up there like in semi-tractor tra trailers. Uh, and that's how the, the drugs get to uh, Montana. So that's why they stopped her. They stopped her because of the drugs, as it turns out. Anyway, okay. When foreign, uh, foreign students seek entry into the United States universities, they are required to take the TOEFL, uh, the test of English as a foreign language, the TOEFL test. And I had never heard of this until uh, I was teaching at Ashford, and we had, uh, we had a bunch of, uh, of international students. They, most of them played soccer. That sounded like a stereotype, but the reality is we had a lot of international students. And they all had to take the TOEFL to make sure that they, could, they understood English well enough to be able to take classes. Uh, research shows that individuals who came from countries that are similar to English, uh, the individuals who spoke Dutch and the individuals that spoke German, uh, perform better on those than those who grew up speaking other European languages that are a little more distant, such as the Romance languages, French and uh, Spanish. Uh, so these, the individuals speaking Dutch and German. And the reason I have these two ladies up there is because she's a Dutch soccer fan and she's a German soccer fan. I couldn't find any, any males that were soccer fans, as odd as that seems. Seems that men don't really wear shirts that say Germany and, and Holland on them. According to the Educational Testing Service, and they're the ones that administer the TOEFL, speakers of Indo-European languages tend to perform better on the TOEFL uh, than those who speak languages uh, from highly distant, lang uh, distant uh, uh, types of languages, such as Kazakh, uh, which is a, uh, a Southern uh, Asian language, or Japanese. And if you've ever tried to speak Japanese or you've ever seen Japanese, there's actually three different languages. There's three different alphabets. Kata, let's see, Kata, Katakana, and there's one other. Okay. What is it? Do you know, do you know Joe? Joe doesn't know. He's just sitting back there making fun of me. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Kata, Katakana, and I can't think of the third one, but uh, it's... I know, there's, there's three, they have three different alphabets. Really kind of weird. So J Japanese is very, a very difficult language to, to, uh, to learn. Kazakh, of course, these, are, these people are Kazakh. They're from southern. Uh, Kazakhstan is uh, between Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, cultural distance encapsulates uh, more than just language. Uh, many other skills must be mastered uh, when people move to a new culture. Uh, Ward and Kennedy in 1995 compared the adjustment of Malaysian university students in New Zealand, a culture that is quite different from their own despite the, uh, the, the fact that it's not that distant. Here's New Zealand right here, and this is Malaysia right here. This, this little thin country right there is Malaysia. At the end of Malaysia is Singapore. Singapore is right there, right at the end of uh, Malaysia. Uh, and, and a group of Malaysian students that, that went to Singapore. Of course, Singapore, the Singaporese uh, um, culture is very similar to uh, the Malaysian culture. And they also speak a similar language. Well, the people in S Singapore was, was, uh, uh, was built by the Brits, okay? So it's a, it was a trading city in, uh, in that part of the world. Uh, so they speak English, they speak Chinese. Most of the people that live in Singapore are, strangely enough, are Chinese, not Malaysian. Uh, so if you read uh, Crazy Rich Asians, or if you hear the book or watch the movie, they talk about Singapore all the time. Uh, this is the is the uh, this is where most people go. Uh, that uh, who are the Crazy Rich Asians? The other place they go is Hong Kong, but Singapore is a very popular destination for crazy rich Asians, as it turns out. And they speak Chinese there. They also speak English. Uh, and they do speak Malaysian to some extent. There, there it is right there, as you can see. Singapore is right at the end of Malaysia. The students uh, completed a measure of cultural adjustment that assessed their daily problems in navigating through the new culture. 
After spending almost three years in the two countries, the Malaysian students who were studying in Singapore reported having fewer difficulties than those who were studying in New Zealand. New Zealand, of course, has more of a culture like England or like Australia. Okay, so they had the uh, the, Mala the Malaysians uh, who went to Singapore had a better had an easier time of it because the culture was more similar. Uh, as we're going to find out, uh, the culture in uh, Singapore and the culture in New <coughs> Zealand, is, despite the fact that they were both uh, established by 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 the Brits, uh, uh, they they were very very different. Sojourners from more distant cultures suffer from more distress. Uh, require more medical consultations and have more social difficulties in general than those who traverse less cultural distance. So if you if you wanted to immigrate someplace, a lot of people want to, uh, a lot of military people, they want to go to England. They want to go to England because they can speak the language, which is almost true. Uh, they don't want to go to Germany, they don't want to go to Japan, they want to go to England. Uh, or they want to go to Hawaii, which is actually a state, so uh, that's not even a it's not an overseas tour <laughs> if you go to Hawaii. It's not overseas at all. Uh, but they want to go to England. Uh, of course, we don't have very many bases left in England. The Air Force does. The Army doesn't have hardly any bases. I don't know if they have any bases at all there. But we have lots of Air Force bases over there. A lot more than we have Army bases, that's for sure. Anyway, everybody wants to go to, to England because they, they know that they can speak the language. Some indigenous Canadian tribes, such as the Simshian uh, of the Northwest uh, Pacific Coast region, engaged in subsistence practices, primarily fishing for salmon and shellfish. And because it is salmon, and because the salmon run every year, they had all the food that they needed. Uh, and of course, they were right there on the ocean so that they, they could catch uh, shellfish uh, all year round. So they had all the food that they, they, they really needed. They could accumulate large quantities of food and uh, these individuals lived in permanent villages uh, along the coast. Uh, they, the uh, villages tend to be, tended to be highly stratified uh, before they had any contact with the Europeans, so they were already building houses and they were living in, uh, in uh, lo relatively large villages. Uh, the reality is if we look at, uh, at indigenous peoples in the United States, we see that there were a lot of uh, areas where they, they had large, relatively large settlements. Uh, Cahokia, for example. Does anybody, has anybody ever heard of Cahokia? Does anybody talk to you about Cahokia? Cahokia was a Mississippian uh, mound builder uh, uh, culture, and they had over 30,000 people living right there. Does anybody know where Cahokia is? You can still go there today. It's kind of cool. It's uh, just south of St. Louis, Missouri. Weird. It's, it, it's, this huge mound, they built this huge mound. And you think, well, how in the world did they do it? They didn't have any earth movers. They didn't have any, how did they move all that dirt? I mean, it's a, it's a plane. And they built, they built this huge mound. It, uh, it's the size of a football field on top. And it's like 100 feet tall. So how much dirt is that? Well, that's a hell of a lot of dirt. Actually, but they built that. Uh, they built that settlement. Uh, they had other large settlements. Uh, there's one in uh, uh, in Michigan. Uh, there's one in uh, Chicago. Uh, was a, a relatively large area. Chicago is actually an Indian word that means wild onions, uh, because there was a swamp right there where they picked wild onions. Uh, my hometown, Muncie, Indiana, was a large, was a relatively large settlement of uh, Miami Indians. Miami, wait a minute, that's down in Florida. Uh, different group. <laughs> so there were large settlements all over the United States, and including the, the Sinchian in, uh, in uh, Canada and the United States. Uh, the Simshian are also in, in Alaska, by the way. Uh, Simshian language, anybody ever heard of this language? They have, they have an individualistic language. It's, uh, it's the Simshian language group, uh, so they had a Simshian language. Uh, the Eastern Cree live uh, just below the tree line in northern Quebec. Uh, they engage in subsistence practices. They hunt in, the, uh, hunt in the winter and they fish in the summer. 
which uh, does not allow them to accumulate very much food, as you can imagine. Uh, so some of the bands are migratory, and they have low socio-cultural stratification. Uh, Chippewa Cree, any, uh, the Cree, has anybody ever heard of these guys? Do you know what language they speak? They speak an Algonquian language. So their language is the same as the Cheyenne. You've probably heard of the Cheyenne, right? You've heard of the Cheyenne. <laughs> and Blackfeet. Blackfeet speak Algonquian as well. So do the Grova of Fort Belknap. Uh, so all the Chippewa and the Cree, the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, uh, all those let, all those people speak uh, a uh, Algonquian language. And of course, they were in the northern portion of the United States. So these guys had very poor uh, stratification, mainly because they were fairly migratory. So they had to move around a lot. They did, they weren't able to settle. Now here's a group. This is this group is called the Carrier Group. Uh, they are Athabascan-speaking people. They live on the Rocky Mountain Plateau of northern British Columbia. They also engage in hunting and fishing like the Eastern Cree. But the difference is they had salmon. Uh, they, uh, they controlled rivers, headwaters of rivers, where the salmon would spawn. So they would get a large influx of salmon uh, in, the, uh, in the spring, uh, and they would be able to accumulate a lot of food. Uh, because of this, of course, uh, they, were, they were somewhere in between the Cree and the Simshian. The Simshian, of course, built uh, permanent settlements, and the, uh, the Cree, uh, of course, were migratory. These guys were somewhere in between, because they would go up into the mountains in the summertime, uh, and in the spring they'd come down and they would harvest, all the, they would harvest salmon. And it was relatively uh, a permanent situation. So their social stratification was somewhere in between the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Cree and the Simshian. And of course they sp spoke the same language that you guys speak. It's an Athabascan language. And these guys are Canadians, which is kind of interesting. It's not the only uh, Athabascan speaking group in uh, Canada. There's another group in Canada that speaks Athabascan. Uh, has anybody ever been to a powwow where there were a lot of Canadians? A lot of color. I love color. <laughs> you can tell which ones are Canadian. <laughs> I got a picture of another Canadian guy at a powwow in just a second. Bear and Anus and Anus. <laughs> Anus in 1974 speculated that the more stratified the culture, the more similar they were to the European culture, uh, the easier it would be to, for them to acculturate to the uh, to the uh, European dominance. Uh, the Simshian uh, acculturated the easiest. The Eastern Cree had the most stress in acculturating, and the Carrier were some somewhere in between. So if we're talking about combat, if we're talking about uh, hostility. Uh, Simshian were never hostile to the Canadian government or to the American government, of course. Uh, Eastern Cree, were the, were, these were the guys that had all kinds of interesting problems. Uh, remember I told you that the Chippewa Cree got kicked out of uh, Canada? Uh, well, there you go. Uh, these guys were kicked out of Canada because they were so hostile to the, to the government. They were more migratory. Uh, their hunting patterns were, they needed, they needed more territory to hunt in. And because of that, uh, these individuals had a lot more trouble. The carrier were pretty much able to stay where they were. And to this day, the carrier are still in that portion of British Columbia. There you go. <laughs> he painted his face yellow. I know, uh, this is a Canadian guy. You can always tell them they, they, they love face paint. They're real big on face paint. Cultural fit is, is the degree to which an individual's personality is more similar to the dominant cultural uh, values in, in the host culture. It would seem that the greater the cultural fit of a person with the host culture, the more easily he or she uh, should acculturate to it. So the more like the, the host culture they are, uh, the more like the easier it will be for that select individual to acculturate. People who score high on extroversion are more likely to move to other countries, particularly to urban areas when uh, compared to those who are less extroverted. So you have to ask yourself, why in the world did all these Europeans come over here? I mean, Europe is not that bad a place. Why in the world would they come to the United States? Well, they had that personality. They had a personality 
they had a wanderlust. They also had uh, a desire to leave, I guess. Uh, my own family came from the middle of England, and we were coal miners in England. And when we came to the United States, we didn't mine coal anymore. We started farming and growing our own damn food, not eating coal dust for, for a living. Uh, so my family's kind of short. I guess that makes a lot of sense if you're a coal miner, because you have to walk down into that hole, that little bitty hole, and you've got to chip away with with a pick or something, whatever they were using at the time. Uh, so that's where my my people come from, the middle of England, the Sheffield area of England, uh, right around that area. Anyway, so we had wanderlust. Evidently, we had wanderlust. We were Quakers. Some of us were Quakers. Most of us were Quakers, so we came, we came over here because we were a, a uh, denigrated religious group in, in, in England, so we came to the United States. Some researchers have proposed that because extroversion should facilitate communication everywhere, extroverts should always fare better in the acculturation experience compared with introverts. Now, I want, I want you to imagine that you are somebody that is hiring somebody to be a CIA agent in some country. That's your job. You are a person that is, you work for HR, Human Resources, for the CIA, and you're looking for somebody who can fit into a country at the, at the easiest as possible. Yeah, we can fit him in. Yeah, we can fit him in. It'll, it'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so if, if you have the, the, uh, the understanding that extroverts always work out better, uh, that they can assimilate better than, than introverts, uh, then you'll hire all extroverts. But we're going to find out that that doesn't work very well, because not all countries are extroverted. Uh, the study in New Zealand found that Malaysians high on the extroversion scale showed more signs of well-being than those who scored low. So this worked in, in New Zealand, so it's more of an extroverted country. It's, it's more English. It's more individualistic. So an extrovert would fit in that, that type of a, a, a society. So if you're hiring somebody to spy on, on, the, on the Kiwis, those wacko guys from New Zealand, then an extrovert would work. So I'm trying to help you just in case you hire somebody to go to New Zealand and spy. However, English-speaking expatriates in Singapore who scored high on the extroversion scale reported more depression, boredom, frustration, and health problems. Wait a minute. I thought extroverts always worked out better. And the answer is no. It all depends on the country that you're going to. Okay, so let's, let's say you're going to... Uh, did, did we talk about northern and southern China? Yeah, we did. We talked about northern and southern China. Okay, so we're, we're looking for a spy to send to China. And we're going to send them to Beijing. Beijing is in northern China. What do they eat in northern China? Fish. In Beijing, you know how far away it is from the coast? Too far. <laughs> so remember, China can be divided in half. In the southern part of the country, they eat rice. In the northern part, they eat wheat. <laughs> so the wheat farmers are the the people that that, uh, that farm wheat are different from the people that that grow rice. Remember that? Okay. So if we were looking for somebody, if we had somebody who spoke Chinese and they were extroverted, where would we send them? Would we send them north or would we send them south? Would we send them to Shanghai, or would we send them to Beijing? Not that we're hiring spies, but just a, just, just a thought. And if we had somebody that was introverted who spoke Chinese, would we send them to Shanghai, or would we send them to Beijing? I don't care. Where do you want to send them? Where do you want to send the extrovert? It doesn't matter. Where do you want to send them? 
You gonna send the extrovert to Shanghai? Okay. What do you think? Shanghai or Beijing? Extrovert. South. You wanna send them south? Extrovert south, that's Shanghai. Here. Are you going to send them to Shanghai? You have no idea why. Are you going to send them to Beijing? Shanghai or Beijing? 50-50. Beijing? Shanghai or Beijing? Shanghai. Shanghai or Beijing? Extra. You're going to send them to Shanghai or you're going to send them to Beijing? Beijing? North is always better, okay. Mm -hmm. Shanghai or Beijing? Beijing. Beijing. Shanghai or Beijing? Not Edison. Beijing. Beijing? Nice better. North Beijing? Beijing. Beijing. Shanghai? Beijing. Beijing. Those, are, those of you who sent the guy to Shanghai, he is a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just executed <laughs> He's going to be talking his Chinese and trying to convince these people and they're going, wow, he's so different from us. I don't like this. This is terrible. Uh, what a great HR you are. This is the problem that the English had. The English thought that as long as you spoke Chinese, it really didn't matter what your personality was. And that's why they lost so many spies uh, in, the, in the 40s and the, uh, the 30s, the 40s and the 50s because they... They just sent people wherever their language skills fit in. And some of them worked and some of them didn't. The, one that, the ones that did work, work had personalities that were very similar to the areas that they were going to. And it only took them 30 years to figure this out. Work, it only took them 30 years and a lot of dead bodies to figure this thing out. One of the reasons that they wrote James Bond, or James Bond became a popular series, is because James Bond, if you noticed, uh, he always went to some places like Monte Carlo. He always went to some place where an extrovert fit in. And of course, this was, and, and actually Ian Fleming that wrote uh, James Bond worked with the, uh, with the MI6 during uh, World War II. And he actually sent people places where they, they were they were uh, seen as spies almost immediately and, and executed. Uh, so then he came up with the whole James Bond series. So it didn't matter if he was extrovert or introvert, it mattered because of his language? If you had language skills, well, no, the language skills are important, but the, also the, your personality is, is important as well. That's what they didn't recognize. They didn't recognize that the, the personality was a factor, or should have been a factor. So you needed people that acted like people from that, that area, that country. So if you send them to Beijing where they're wheat farmers and they're extroverts, then you're okay with the extrovert. But uh, you needed to send the introvert to uh, Shanghai. Okay. Extroversion uh, does not always facilitate acculturation, obviously, since we just killed off all of these guys. <laughs> A whole set of spies going into Shanghai. It appears that an extroverted personality makes a better cultural fit in New Zealand than it does in Singapore, and extroverts will fare better in the acculturation experience only when they fit in well with the culture. And of course, we can take this one to the bank. So uh, those people who were extroverted and they were sent to Germany uh, had no problems whatsoever. Um, if you were sent, to, if you were an extrovert and you were sent to Japan, you had a horrible, horrible time. Because the Japanese are, it's a collectivist country, and they're far less extroverted than, than, uh, than most Americans. America, and this is one of the reasons why uh, they had so much trouble with the Marines in, uh, in Japan. Uh, Marines are taught to be outgoing, they're, they're, you know, they're, this is how they're trained, uh, the first to die, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, so these guys had a lot of trouble in Japan. Uh, the Japanese, uh, well, well, we'll talk about, more about the Japanese in just a second. Highly ex extroverted immigrants fare better in terms of their well-being when they immigrate to countries with overall more pronounced levels of extroversion like the United States. And yada, yada, yada. Okay. <clears throat> uh, people with uh, more independent self-concepts have been found to suffer less distress in, in acculturating to the United States than people with more interdependent self-concepts and people who have patterns of emotions that are more similar to those from the host culture 
report experiencing greater relational well-being. It's easier for you to be accepted by the lady that works down in the, uh, uh, the uh, corner store uh, if you act like somebody who is German or you have a personality that is similar to somebody that is German. One of the things that surprised me the most, if you go to England, if you go to England and uh, there is more than, than three people uh, waiting for something, they will, they will line up and they will line up in what they refer to as a queue. Uh, so in England, if you wander around England, you see all these people waiting for a bus and they're all standing there in a line, you know, being, all, being good Brits. Uh, but if you go to Germany and uh, there are a bunch of people that uh, want the same thing, uh, they'll, they want to be the first one. Everybody wants to be the first one. Uh, we were at a um, uh, roller rink, an ice skating rink in, uh, in Freiburg in Germany. It's the only ice skating rink they had in Germany. I know that it was Zweibrück and it was on the Air Force Base and the Air Force Base had been Canadian. So the first thing they built on the base was at the airstrip. It was the ice skate rink. Because they're Canadian. Okay, anyway. Uh, so they were, they were all, uh, it was time to leave and all the Germans had to leave the base. Uh, and they all, I, I was surprised that the person working behind the counter wasn't killed by all those Germans because they're all grabbing a hold of his shirt and trying to get him to take their shoes. Their skates. I know, it was weird. And of course, we're Americans and we're going, my God, they're so aggressive. <sighs> and so my kids and I, we waited until they were, all the Germans got out of the way because they were certainly not going to line up. That was the last thing they were ever going to do. And the Brits, on the other hand, of course, they all lined up. Uh, one acculturation strategy is that people need to participate in the larger society of their host culture. All the people motivated to acquire an identity consistent with that of the host culture are the people motivated to acquire an, an identity consistent with that of the host culture. And the answer is, yeah, they should be. Are these people striving to maintain their own heritage, culture, and identity as members of that culture? And the answer is, they should be. Uh, do people have positive attitudes toward their heritage culture and are they actively seeking ways to preserve the traditions of their heritage culture? And this is really a question that we have to ask ourselves. So how and why are they doing what they're doing? And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Another strategy of acculturation involves attempting to fully participate in the host culture while at the same time striving to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. And this is known as, as uh, integration strategy, where you integrate your culture into the, the host culture's uh, uh, culture. Um, uh, an example would be uh, a lady from the United States uh, buying a kimono in uh, Japan. So if she had to go to a formal dinner, she would put on her kimono. But she had, she'd have to do it right. The Japanese get really offended if you put on your kimono incorrectly. There is a way to do it, and it takes hours to put on a kimono, as you can imagine. Yeah, and they're expensive. Oh my god, they're expensive. And the thing about Japanese kimonos, <clears throat> this is a Japanese kimono. This is what a Japanese kimono looks like. When they make them for Americans, this is what they look like. <laughs> You probably, uh, as far as the structure is concerned, they're identical. But the difference is the colors. Japanese are, they have very dull color choices. Everything's like pastel. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. Not only that, but they, some of the colors don't really go together very well. And that's very Japanese. <sighs> We, we used to go, there was a store in Misawa, we were, we were stationed in Misawa, and we, and we would go to the, this, uh, this store, and they had a uh, kimono shop in it, and they had all these kimonos for sale, and of course they were all like 10,000 yen, 50,000 yen, and whatnot, but they were all really odd colors, I mean just, and they didn't go together, none of the colors went together, it was just the oddest thing in the world. But if you've ever listened to Japanese music, not Japanese pop music, but Japanese traditional music, their notes don't seem to go together either. There's something about the Japanese where they like discordances. And their, their colors just do not go together. Now, Americans, on the other hand, of course, you know, we've been 
raised with the Paris fashions coming out. And so usually we know what colors go together, but the Japanese haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, so a lot of their colors are really, I mean, they'll wear a kimono that's the color of this rug. Uh, or lighter. It looks like vomit green. I mean, it's... <laughs> Here I am insulting the Japanese. They don't... So I'm sorry, but their, their color sense is, is not all that good <clears throat> that, I can, that I saw when I was there. Of course, I was there a long time ago, like 1995, so maybe things have changed. The strategy that involves little or no effort to participate in the host culture or uh, to maintain the traditions of heritage culture is known as the marginal, marginalization strategy. These individuals not only reject their own culture, but they also reject the whole host culture. They reject everything. <clears throat> now the last one, the integration strategy, uh, they accepted both the host culture and they accepted their own culture. So they tried to live in both worlds, a foot in both worlds. These guys don't have a foot in either world. They reject both the, the host culture and they reject their own culture. People using this strategy have negative views toward uh, both their heritage and their host cultures. Uh, this strategy may be something uh, pursued more by people who have grown, grown up in multiple cultures across their childhood. And because of that, they reject both cultures. They don't want to seem like the host culture and they don't want to seem like their own culture. Uh, we saw this sometimes up north uh, we had individuals that were, were uh, fostered off the reservation. And maybe you saw it here when they, when they took the kids and they moved them up to Utah, when they took the, 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 the kids from here. Okay. When they came back, they weren't really Navajo, right? Well, that's what happened up there. When they, when they came back to the reservation, they didn't understand the traditions. They, didn't, uh, they, had, they had been taught that those traditions were heathen. And so they, they rejected those, uh, those traditions. Uh, yet they weren't part of the new culture. They didn't feel like they were part of the new culture. If they were what we refer to as passing, do you understand the term passing? Where you look pale enough that you can pass for a white person. We see the same thing in the, in the African American culture. We see the same thing in the Hispanic culture. Some people are passing. They reject their their, uh, their uh, birth heritage. And this is one of the things we saw up north. And so the, a lot of these individuals, uh, they just rejected both cultures. They were too dark to be accepted in the white culture, but they didn't really want to be part of their own native culture. So they just kind of floated somewhere in between. Not happily, by the way, because they didn't have anybody to support them. I mean, who's going to support somebody that, that uh, rejects all, all, all the cultures? <clears throat> uh, some individuals who have grown up in uh, multiple cultures are sometimes referred to as uh, third culture kids and thus uh, will identify themselves as global citizens. So they don't identify with, uh, with uh, the United States. They don't identify with the new culture. They see themselves as global citizens. Uh, a lot of times wealthy people will, will reject their, their culture because it, it is poor people that uh, are patriotic, that, that act like Americans, uh, and uh, they, wherever they're living they reject that culture as well. Uh, they, they see themselves as a citizen of the world, <clears throat> a jet setter. So they don't belong anywhere, as strange as that may seem. And we see this from time to time. Um, during World War II, we had a lot of... These, these individuals usually become expatriates. Uh, so they leave the United States and they don't come back. Uh, and they live in a certain culture. But a lot of times they don't even accept that culture. Uh, there are people in the United, from the United States who leave the United States because they're pissed off about one thing or another. They don't like the taxes, they don't like this, or they don't like whatever. Uh, and they move to Mexico, but they're not Mexican, and they don't, they don't really uh, appreciate the Mexican culture. But the, so they are expatriates. They are citizens of the world. They're third culture kids. Some res, uh, researchers do not accept marginalization as a legitimate acculturation strategy, but as a form of neuroticism. In other words, they see them as insane. 
as crazy as part of them, not really seriously crazy, but they see them as rejecting all culture. And because of that, they see them as neurotic. The assimilation strategy involves an attempt to fit in and fully participate in the host culture while making little or no effort uh, to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. Uh, it involves having positive attitudes toward the heritage culture. It reflects a desire to leave behind the ancestral past so as to fit in with the host culture. This is what they were trying to do with the boarding schools. They were trying to get you guys to reject your culture. They were trying to get you to assimilate. This is what they were trying to do with the immigrants. They were trying to get them to reject the old country and accept the new country and become patriotic to the new country. As it turned out, of course, in uh, 1917, we started, well, we didn't start the war. The war was already going on. We joined the war against the Germans. So what, what's going to happen with all, remember, between uh, 1880 and 1920, we had 60% of the people that immigrated to the United States immigrated to the United States, and the largest group were the Germans. So who were, they, who were they loyal to? Were they loyal to us or were they loyal to the Germans? Well, we hope so. <laughs> so what did we do to these poor guys? I don't know if you've heard the story. Uh, they would ride in the street and if you had a German name, you either changed your name or they beat you. And sometimes they killed, they killed people that had German names. And this happened all over the United States. Ask Dr. Wolf. Yeah, her family is one of the families that had to change their names just to stay alive. If your name was Schneider, S C H I E S C H E I N D E R, you had to change your name to Schneider, S N I D E R, which is an English name. If your name was Müller, which is German for Miller, you had to change your name to Miller. And if you didn't, then people would break the windows in your house. They, they, they would chase your children down the street. Uh, they potentially would tar and feather you and, and maybe kill you if your name was Miller. Miller. Yeah. Which is a which is a good is which is a good German name. We have uh, the guy that's running the uh, Russian investigation, his name M U E L L E R. His family came to the United States after World War I. <laughs> Hence, he was able to keep his name. And it looks like the German name. The separation strategy involves efforts to maintain the traditions of the heritage culture while making little or no effort to participate in the host culture. A good example is the Boston uh, Marathon bom bomber, Bombers. Uh, they were from, what were they from? Were they from Turkey? They were from someplace. Anyway, they didn't like what we were doing in the United States. So they more adhered to their, home, their, their birth culture than they did to the American culture. And they put together pressure cooker, cooker bombs and then exploded them at the Boston Marathon. What were their names? One of them was killed. The other guys went to prison. This strategy is composed of positive attitudes toward the heritage culture and neg negative attitudes toward the host culture. Uh, people pursuing separation strategies do not wish to acculturate to the host culture. One of the interesting things about looking at families that have immigrated to the United States, usually the females are much better at assimilating or acculturating than the males are. And this is one of the reasons why we look at those, those individuals like the, uh, uh, the uh, NSA and the FBI, they, they look at these, these types of families and they identify the brothers as to whether the brothers are really acculturating or not. Usually they don't have to worry about the females. We usually don't have to worry about females exploding a bomb at the Boston Marathon. It's usually the males. They are the ones that acculturate uh, don't acculturate as well. Can you see any reason why the males would have a problem acculturating whereas the females wouldn't? What 
what's the difference between boys and girls except boys have long hair? No, that's back. I think that the females are the, the giver of life and then the males is like... The lone wolf? Yeah. <laughs> the rejected people? <laughs> what, what's wrong with guys? You know what's wrong with guys. Big-headed. <laughs> They're pig-headed? <laughs> You're right. They're stubborn. They are stubborn. Why are they more stubborn than females? Remember, we talk about the female brain. The female brain is more flexible than the male brain. Female brain has a larger cor corpus callosum. They can, communicate, they can communicate better between the left and right hemispheres. The male has a much smaller cor corpus callosum. It's more hardwired. And maybe that has something to do with it. Strange to know. No, this is weird, isn't it? So what's wrong with guys? And of course you guys can tell us all day long what's wrong with guys. Don't tell Travis, it hurts his feelings. <laughs> That's my favorite picture. <laughs> the most common strategy people pursue is the integration strategy, of course. <clears throat> they try to become part of the culture, but they also accept their own culture. Uh, they don't reject their own culture. Um, but they also accept the host culture. The least common strategy is marginalization strategy. Uh, it's really tough to, to uh, live without uh, being uh, close to some, anybody, to somebody. Uh, so usually uh, we, we try to maintain our own cultures. One of the things I did when I was in the military, because I was moving around so much, and because we were like everywhere, Mississippi, Texas, California, uh, where else were we? Ohio. Oh my God, Ohio. Those people from Ohio are so different from everybody else. Germany, uh, Japan. Uh, because of that, I try to maintain my Hoosier culture, my Indiana culture, my Indiana farm culture. Uh, so anytime we lived someplace, I tried to live off base. I tried to live away from the city. I hate cities. I don't, I'm not a city person. I live in a cornfield. Well, actually, I live in a in the soybean field this year. Uh, and I enjoy it. Uh, when we lived in Texas, people are, what time is it? It's, it's 2.37. That's what I have. What, what time do you guys have? 2.30. Uh, 2.40, okay. Let's, let's say 2.40. Okay. 2.45. <laughs> A person will not strive to fit into the host culture if that culture shows a good deal of prejudice toward the individual's own cultural group. And this was happening during, um, uh, well, after 9-11. After 9-11, of course, it was uh, militant Muslims are the ones that uh, flew the airplanes into the uh, World Trade Center and into the, in, into the Pentagon. Uh, we've already talked about where these people were from. Where were they from? Twelve out of fourteen were from the same country. And what country was that? This is important because we've never done anything about it. We had invaded another country, but we we'd invaded two other countries, but neither of them had anything to do with twelve of these people came from the same country. What was that country? There's somebody that's an ally with us right now. And, well, not them. I don't, I don't mean them. If there are allies, they're not going to attack us. Joe knows. Where are those guys from? No, I'm just from. Oh. <laughs> from Navajo country. No, they don't. <laughs> Where are those guys from? These Muslims, these ones that uh, flew into the World Trade Center. 12 out of 14 were from Saudi Arabia. The other two were from Jordan. Wait a minute, we haven't attacked either Jordan or Saudi Arabia. However, we did invade Afghanistan. That's where they were Al-Qaeda, and that's where Al-Qaeda was, was headquartered. And the guy that was in charge of Al-Qaeda at the time was Osama bin Laden. And he was from Saudi Arabia. So why did we invade Iraq? Assumption. I'm sorry? Assumption. Profiling. Ah, I'm talking to you profiling. There wasn't anything, <laughs> anything to profile. My goodness. We claimed that they were actually 
uh, Trump made a claim that uh, I, the Iranians are are financing terrorism all around the world. We made the same claim claim about Iraq. Of course, at the same time, twelve uh, Saudi Arabians had just flown in and destroyed uh, por portions of New York City and the Pentagon. So why did we invade Saudi Arabia? They were our allies, that's why. Okay. Why did we invade Iraq? I'm not exactly sure. Lots of excuses. None of them make sense. A lot of pissed off people. Around the world, they wouldn't join us in the invasion of Iraq. People who have physical features that distinguish them from the majority of those in their host culture will likely experience more prejudice than people who have physical features that allow them to blend in with their host culture. This is a good example as to why African Americans have more, far more difficult time assimilating in the United States than anybody else. They have different physical features. Their skin is dark. So did, does darkness have to do with anything? Well, it even has to do in, with, uh, I told you about, last time I was talking about uh, School Days, the uh, movie made by, uh, and, and I invite you to, to watch the movie, it's really kind of a fascinating movie. Uh, but the lighter skinned individuals were the ones that were the most, most sought after individuals. So a woman who was lighter complexioned was more sought after than uh, someone, someone with a darker complexion. So if you look at the, all the, the black movie stars, the ones that are the most popular are the ones who are the lighter complexion. And that's not only in, with white people, because they look almost white. Halle Berry looks almost white. Her mother's white. Her dad's black. Uh, but uh, it's also among African Americans. It's not just with white people, it's with African Americans. So the lighter skinned you are, the lighter complexioned you are, the more likely that you will be, uh, be accepted. They made all kinds of interesting movies in the 1940s, 1930s and 1940s about how some black people could pass for being white and these individuals were accepted into society until somebody found out that their mother was black or whatever. Uh, there were a couple very relatively famous movies about that, as strange as that may seem. So the more different somebody is, the more likely they will be targeted as somebody who is unacceptable by the host culture. This is kind of interesting. I have a student who just came back, came over from Bangladesh, and he's trying to fit into the uh, culture in uh, Dayton, Ohio. He goes to Wright State. So we'll see how he does. He didn't call me last week, crying. So I guess we're okay. <laughs> the two weekends before, he did call me. And he was really upset because he wasn't being treated very well. People think that he's, uh, he's Iranian or they think he's Pakistani or they think he's Syrian or he, they think he's some kind of a terrorist. But he's from Bangladesh. I know. More physically distinct ethnic groups are more likely to maintain negative attitudes toward the host culture and pursue separation or marginalization strategies. We see this in the black uh, culture. Uh, we see this with, uh, with uh, black gangs. That's what a gang is for. Uh, we see this with Hispanic gangs. We see this with MS-13. Uh, MS-13 was not a group from Guatemala. No. Where did they come from? El Salvador? El Salvador. They were people that were born in the United States who were El Salvadorian, who formed a gang, and then they went back to El Salvador, and they became pretty fairly vicious monsters. But these guys are second generation El Salvadorians in the United States, and they have formed this gang. And of course, uh, they, 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 they have everything just all screwed up, because the reality is they're actually from Los Angeles, MS-13. It's not, it's not a group from El Salvador crossing the border and, and, and uh, uh, doing things in the United States. It's a group of people from the United States who, if they go back to El Salvador, if they send them back to El Salvador, they're just as bad down there as they are up here. Physically distinct ethnic groups are more likely to actively uh, 
to actively support collective uh, efforts to benefit their group's social position, people who are of lower socioeconomic status or who are members of indigenous cultural groups are more likely to pursue separation or marginalization strategies because the host culture does not typically offer them much that they desire. And I've told you the story about living in Mississippi in 1995 through 1997, 1998, 1998. Um, in the town where I lived, if you were African American, uh, and you were female, then you, potentially you could get a job. If you were African American and you were male, there was no job for you anywhere. They wouldn't hire you. No matter how much education you had, it didn't really make any difference. And these were the individuals who uh, were marginalized. So what do you do if you're a black man living in Mississippi? What would you do if you were a black person living in Mississippi? You were a black male living in Mississippi. And nobody would give you a job. And if you got caught speeding, they gave you a ticket. And if you got caught robbing uh, a bank or a jail, or, or, or not a jail, if you're a store or anything, well, they threw, threw you in jail and they threw away the key. If you were a black man living in Mississippi. So what would you do if you were black and living in Mississippi? Move. That makes sense. Or does it? You guys want to leave the res? You want to move to Albuquerque so that where the people are actually nicer to you? I mean, who wants to leave their home, right? If you have lived there all your life and your family's been there all your life, Oprah Winfrey is from just south of where I used to live. How's Did you know her? No. <laughs> no, she was already in Chicago and making millions and millions of dollars, or billions and billions of dollars. I don't know. Anyway, so what would you do? I leave is, I, that's one answer to, to the question, but who wants to leave their home? The other thing is, how can you, how, where are you going to get the money to leave? And what if Wait, you, where are you going to get the money to survive in Mississippi anyway if nobody's giving you a job? Nobody's giving you a job. It, it's tough. It's rough. Well, there's welfare to some extent. Take, it's not take nearly. Take a chance of leaving. Live on welfare until you find a job. Until you find a job, which doesn't exist. Well, not in Mississippi. Not in Mississippi. Yeah. So how do you leave? And where do you have to go to find some place where they'll give you a job? Out of the state, out of the region, out of yeah. the region. It's rough. Does, do, do you see the same thing here? In Gallup, if you're if you're native and you go to Gallup and try to find a job, is it harder for natives to find a job in Gallup than it is if you were a non-native? Or Phoenix? <laughs> Some of you guys have lived in Phoenix. How easy was it living in Phoenix? Is it paradise? It is. I think it would be easier to easier. get a job at Phoenix. They cut your lawn for you. You don't have to work outside. Wow. Everything at the grocery store is just right down the street. And there's a bar right next door to your apartment. Who could be better than that? Easy. Easy to laugh. So where do you find the job? Do you, right they? next door, Burger King. Burger King, Ohio? Okay. Uh -huh. Jack in the box. Good food? Mm -hmm. well, bad food. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rough life. So we should all move to Phoenix. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that the word I... No. Okay. Has anybody lived in Phoenix as an adult? Yeah. It was easy. Piece of cake. Mm -hmm. You'd move back in a nanosecond. Yeah. So, I was just wondering. No, Phoenix? Yeah. No. What? Any place? King, Salt Lake? King was what is it? King was good, yeah. Racist. Oh, yeah, really good. <laughs> <laughs> they're all good for the, you go over the mountains and then there's all this, well, this side there's talks so that. You go towards the other side of the humans. You go the other way, we hurt him, we talk. <laughs> Does anybody know any place to go where I can find a job? And not me, but you guys can find a job. It's a better place than. On the res? Durango. Durango? 
Colorado? Yep. All right. <coughs> not, they're not racing stuff there, are they? Uh, there's a lot of people that don't want to be mad. Dude, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're stones. So. Yeah. yeah. They probably can't see very well. Anyway. It's probably like Amsterdam over there. <laughs> you have your own tribe. I think that's perfect. <laughs> okay, I'll see you.